<laughs> Hi everyone, um, I'm Lucia Sennett, I'm Deputy Director here at Dallas Contemporary. Um, welcome uh, to uh, talk with our artists and curator um, from this beautiful show, Cartoon Configuration. Um, we are joined today by curator Allison Jungeris here in Blue, um, Umar Rashid, um, who's our Umar Jungeris here, uh, Carolina Jablonska, who uh, finds us here and here, and Taboo, who is behind you and to your right. Sally Saul is not able to join us today. She's flown back to New York already, um, but her works at this round one is on the table. Um, the show has been a delight to be uh, part of over the last year or so, um, thinking through it with Allison and, and um, helping kind of usher it along. Um, it's a really important show. Um, I think it can maybe seem a little silly at first glance, but there's a lot of um, context, subtext to these works, which uh, uh, makes it very important, relevant material for the moment we're living in, especially in Texas. Um, but it's also very funny, and you have some very, very funny people on the stage who you probably end up laughing more than you um, scowl. So um, I hope you enjoy it, and I'm going to hand it over to Allison. Thank you so much, uh, Lucia, and thank you so much to the staff of Dallas Contemporary who have done an outstanding job. I have to plug the fact that we not only have a brochure that you should take with information about all the artists and the works in the show, but also a zine that Lucia spearheaded and is really special, so collector's item, please pick one up. Uh, but before, uh, I just wanted to say a few prefatory remarks before we get into the conversation because I think we're really here for a conversation today. Um, this is probably the worst exhibition title I have ever come up with. <laughs> um, it, it was really good as an essay title for Carolina's book that came out two years ago, I think. Um, in which I was thinking both about an art historical problem of the kind of historical bias against figurative work, but specifically kind of cartoony work that emerged in American art, at least, in the um, post-war period, and was always sort of sneered at as either a regional thing, like from Chicago, the Imagists of the 60s, or San Francisco, the funk movement, or even Philip Gustin, who was basically totally insulted because he abandoned abstract expressionism in order to make his hood paintings, which as we all know now, are deeply complex and deal with the very dark history of this country, uh, with racism and anti-Semitism, but in this cartoony envelope. And um, for, so anyway, I never got around to getting a better exhibition title, but I think this title, Who's Afraid Of, comes from Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, um, and the play in which the signifier of Virginia Woolf stands for something even though it's not about her. And in a way, the cartoony, like no one's afraid of the cartoony, but that's why it's so powerful, because it's this vehicle in which artists can you know, address super serious issues and, and content and personal content. Um, and, and yet still make us laugh, make us smile, um, poke us, um, you know, prod us into learning more about different things. So I'm gonna try to bring us together into conversation, but also get all of you to speak about your work. We have some very wonderfully loquacious artists in this group. Um, and uh, I think I'll start with Carolina, because I think, um, a lot of people might walk in and see these works, which obviously deal with a very gendered space of the kitchen and of cooking and of her own image as a woman. Um, she appears in multiple paintings. But the backstory, um, not only the historical backstory of that you know, history of care and unpaid labor of the kitchen, but um, <clears throat> the fact that she was making these paintings while participating in one of the most important uh, political acts in Eastern Europe in the last years, the women's strike, the, the black protests in which the right-wing government in Poland had passed the most restrictive abortion laws in Europe. Um, 
which I think we can all identify with here with what's happened with the Supreme Court and specifically with Texas, what's happening with these laws. So, um, Carolina, maybe you could just, t like we've done this already once this week, but <laughs> uh, maybe you could just start to talk to us a little bit about how, like the first painting you made and your emotional state and how you kind of use this cartoony allegory of the kitchen to, to talk about all of these things that you were going through in those protests. Yeah, uh, thank you, Alison, for um, for introduction. <laughs> uh, so, and also, thank you, everybody, for coming here. It's uh, such a honor to have a so huge and um, beautiful audience. So, thank you. I, I came here straight from Krakow, from Poland, so it's, yeah, it's just a honor to be here. Uh, yeah, so, um, as Alison said, um, actually, when I started working on this series, I wasn't sure, and it's always like this with my paintings, I, I'm never sure what these paintings are about, uh, because everything is going on intuitively. I have a certain package of emotions that I want to put into the paintings, and the story developed after, developed after all. Uh, but, but with this painting with a red soup uh, and a head inside of it, uh, it was a little bit different story because, as Alison mentioned, uh, there was this uh, huge movement in Poland in 2020. Yeah. Yes. Uh, in 2020. Uh, you know, it was in the middle of uh, lockdown, uh, middle of pandemic, so we were not supposed to go outside and strike on the streets, but um, our uh, right-wing government decided to um, proceed this anti-abortion law at the time, so there was no choice but go. Actually, when this protest started, I was just um, at home uh, cooking a zoo. <laughs> uh, and everybody went to the protest, but I was afraid to go because, you know, it was pandemic. Uh, a lot of police came. They said, uh, um, yeah, they said we, we are not allowed to go. So I started to cook this soup, but, <laughs> but I knew all my friends are there and I just decided to go. And it was so like, heartwarming and it was so somehow built me up to, to, to go there and be with all these people and protest against the thing that is so destroying for our our society. So and then the strikes last for probably two months um, but they passed this law anyway. So at the beginning we had this huge power inside of a Society, you know, female power, but not only female protesters, like everybody protested. They were really huge. The biggest protest uh, from, like, the biggest since, like, solidarity yeah, in, in so the anti communist I didn't see anything like that in my life, so it was something very huge. So we, we got this power and then they cut it off because they passed this law anyway without listening to society. Uh, so we uh, just hopelessness left. Uh, and this painting is a little bit about it, this huge amount of emotion and power, but somehow destroyed at one moment, so, somehow boiled. Uh, but you know, you don't need to know this story. I think you can pack your own emotions to, to my paintings because there are like multi dimensional. So even if you don't know something, you can, you can maybe somehow feel uh, what these paintings are about. Well, I think they also connect to a long history of feminist artists who engaged with the traditional role, a woman's place is in the kitchen, barefoot and pregnant. So, um, of course, from Martha Rossler to, you know, so many, so many. Um, 
your work also reads on that level of, um, you know, the woman's place in the home, but also like the cooking disaster, the, the apron on fire. I mean, there's there's also this kind of deadly humor that's yeah. in your uh, in your work and in all of the artists' work at yeah. the end of the show. So I decided to use this um, this kitchen environment because it's well known for everybody uh, and. Yeah, as yeah, as you said, it's um, packed with uh, all this art historical context. So uh, yeah, I decided it's a, a it's a good space to put this uh, serious uh, serious uh, message in, um, to this environment. Uh, also because kitchen is something familiar, something you can some, something maybe. And funny, so uh, yeah, you can put serious um, matters inside of this space, and it could be a little bit lighter, a little bit more uh, accessible uh, this way. Uh, yeah, maybe I should also mention about self-portrait uh, because it's something appearing in my art uh, quite often. So, uh, these are not really self-portraits. Self I, I really want to build a portrait of, of made-up woman, uh, but real and at the same time not real, because um, in some point it's me, but the character of my paintings, uh, she's built from many different characters, from uh, my experiences, from books, from many different sources, but uh, what is important to me uh, is, is to place myself um, as a female artist um, inside of, um, like, I don't know, art history or like inside of art in general. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, in the spirit of also trying to make like intersectional connections, yeah. I think that the self-portrait is something that both Umar and Tabu also engage in to some degree. And I guess I wanted to make a bridge too between the this this kind of struggles we have right now, um, politically speaking, because Tabu's work, Tabu started. There's Tabu. <laughs> first of all, I think these are self-portraits. When I first, I didn't know you when I first got oh, that's you? But the more I've known you over the week, you turn here, such an incredible nose. <laughs> and the nose, it's like, wow, that's you, that is you. So, you see it now. And you are there, too. Yeah, Tabu. Tabu is here. Tabu is my nose, also, yes. Um, the Armenian nose. But, uh, so, yes. And so, I'm I was identified with, uh, how you were uh, moved by like all the people taking to the streets and going, whoa, that, how do you really do this? I remember in my own life, I mean, I'm 65. But, uh, I wasn't at the first Cape Pride thing, but I remember when I went to my very first Cape Pride march, I was maybe a teenager, just being out, going, whoo, you know, okay, walking down the street. But it was wild, it was so uh, life affirming, you know what I mean? And, uh, and I remember you talked about when the police are coming to my vehicle outside. I remember that. Maybe this guy, everything's yesterday, I'm old. I live in the moment, but yesterday, let's say, yesterday, there was this queen called Matthew Shepard. He was this cute little print guy, and the local fat guy just killed him and beat the shit out of him and hung him on a fence like a, like a coyote. And uh, it was outrageous. And it, somehow, it was maybe, I don't think it was Texas, but it was somewhere out west. Well, I was going to say with the hate gays, but the hate gays everywhere. Like the hate women, like the hate blacks. And, well, wait, what are they going? They're hating my aunt, they're knocking it off now. Okay, so I remember it was a spontaneous thing. I did just protest this thing. We all went up to like uh, the Pop Plaza Hotel. We all started gathering. And I looked around. I'm like, oh my God, are we going to be killed? Are we going to be killed? And the, whole, and the police came on horses because Hillary Clinton, maybe we should run for president or she was a governor or a senator or she was there. Maybe she was just the first lady staying at the hill and they went to protect her from these mobs. We were going to, we just protect, we were protesting. You know, we gaze up. Uh, we're the gentle ones, you know. Like in, uh, in uh, the movie by John Barnett, which 
They capture the girl, they bleach her hair, they pack her hair, and say, Ow, you hurt me! I thought you gays were gentle. <laughs> but, um, so we are gentle. When the horse police came up, you're being trampled by horses. Oh my god, it hurts me so emotional. Like, fuck you, right? Kill me, motherfucker! <laughs> Kill me! You know, like, wow, it's so powerful. And you know, and even during like the Black Lives Matter, Trump's COVID shit, the gay pride kind of ceased to exist that year, which is the biggest uh, parade in the whole city, bigger than the St. Patrick's Day, from New York City, by the way. Uh, it merged with the Black Lives Matter and the trans Black Lives Matter. And that was a whole emotional thing, so I totally get it. You wouldn't necessarily think, anyway, by my opinion, that there's some wild political statement. Like, this, I'd see, you could really see the political statement here. Yeah. The chopping, the white, the white man is chopping, the black, you know, that whole But this, you wouldn't necessarily know, like, a girl with her hand in the pickle jar. It's a little more, like you said, gentle. If you want to get your mom, I it's, anyway. But so I, uh, But if I may say, oh, taboo, yes, just because uh, I think that when you did the staff walkthrough for, uh, for us, and yeah. as a longtime fan, yeah. who knew your history as doing drag and performance, but also creating the visual culture of the 80s of the East Village, yes. your whole oral history and each work as you explained what you made the work for, what it, you know, what it's it was about. It's a political just by being myself. Absolutely. Yeah, so and that's why my name taboo comes from. It's like, being a fag, or being a drag, or being an artist. If you're taboo, I'm like, okay, I'm taboo. <laughs> they can change me. You know, laws are made to be broken. I'm going to be myself anyway. I'm going to love my, live my gay life. Taboo. Yeah. Sure. What happened? This is a perfect example. Wow. Hell, what are you giving me? Oh, bitch! Oh, bitch! <laughs> 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 oh, my God. Oh, my God. This is one of my dear sisters. <laughs> I'm going to get on a plane back to New York. Oh, okay. Oh, you have that. You know, I have your on. She's here. Okay, that's his tent, y'all. One of the great, great performers. Like, in the whole foggy ball scene, like, she would take the mic and read the queens to shit. So good. And she would show us with a paper bag puppet, like, you know, a sandwich bag puppet. I still have my wall. I treasure you. Wow. And she would escape to Texas. And they didn't kill her. I heard they're killing dragons in Texas. It's illegal. <laughs> To entertain people? Really? You're kidding me. Well, I won't go back to Texas anytime soon. But, and I gotta drag out, because God knows I won't be strung up like Master Shepherd. They won't get me. What's that sound? I won't be God damn it. Oh, I had a second. She had a great song. Ah, Martin Lisa, I'm, they shot Martin Lisa, but they won't shoot me, because I won't be caught dead on any balcony. That was a fact of great. Anyway, how does that cover spawn? Well, it corresponds in that <laughs> your work, which really begins in like 82 with the Pyramid Club flyer oh, for the food. The from the Pyramid, yeah, from the pyramid Club. Those are on the wall that I can see them. This is just a You know, like a, a pillar of the downtown <laughs> scene yeah. in which all the artists are And these are all self portraits too, by the way, too. Like, exactly. Like, in fact, that second picture is actually a photograph of me as a woman, or as a drag queen, as a presented female, or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, the second one. And the third one is a portrait of me. Well, they say all artists is a portrait, right? And we're, it's you, as whatever, like all these little figures. You can't see it because your face ain't this great. But if you have a chance before you <laughs> run off to lunch or whatever, those are all me, self portraits, but portrayed in like puppets of, and yes, some of them are Asian, and some of them are animals, and some of them are women, and some of them are skeletons. But it's all me. I'm very multiple disconnery, as you call that. I do many, many things. <laughs> and I'm very many people and I won't be pigeonholed. Everyone, everyone wants to pigeonhole everybody, you know? Well, that's the, this is where I think our show is actually very interesting in regards to identity politics and the siloing of people purely by identity. And this is one of the reasons that I invited Umar into the show because Umar's work is part of a, like, trans-historical narrative in which the title of the I always call it the title. What's the title? Um, wait, 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 wait. Of the, <laughs> of, of like the overall uh, arching. The, the, the rise and the rise and um, the, the rise and fall of the Free English Empire. Yes, and so Umar has reimagined the history uh, of of colonialism and of imperial conquest with a different outcome, in which indigenous black and brown people often win, and. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But also are not, you know, 
siloing anyone particularly and bringing in humor and anachronism and your own lived experiences and, and emotional responses to what we're going through. So Umar's work is the most site-specific to Texas. Yes. Um, so thank you for the introduction, Allison. And um, yeah, so basically, um, you know, I, I come from a film theater background, actually. Um, so about two, 2,000 years ago, no, thousands of years ago, uh, no, like in 2000, I moved uh, and I graduated uh, college, couldn't get a job, taking photographs, couldn't get a job making films. So I started painting. And, um, you know, um, I've always loved history. And uh, when I was in high school and grammar school, I would always like, I mean, it's have a capacity to store large amounts of information. And so I would always have a tutor people in history. But the history that I read, I was always omitted from that particular narrative. So around the same time, around 2000, um, I discovered, not saying I, I didn't Columbus it, like it was there. Uh, it was called the, uh, the Gutenberg Project. And that's when people started digitizing large volumes of alternative books. So you didn't have the books that we all probably grew up with that were horribly racist in um, high school and grammar school, which only told a one-dimensional story of empire. So now you have all these different stories. So what I did is I decided not really, I didn't really change, I mean, I changed history, but I didn't change everything about it, it just included other, just other stories. Like, and, you know, flash forward to now, uh, we exist in a very precarious place, but for me, it, it's always kind of been that way, you know, as a black man uh, in America, growing up here, um, you know, I always feel like some, you know, I, I feel like high anxiety every day, like just by existing, you know. Like, I don't even jog, you know? Like, people are like, well, you can get in shape. But I was like, yeah, just give me a fucking bottle of vodka and I'll just sit here. But, you know, I don't even jog or work out outside because, you know, somebody will think I stole some ice purse and I'll get shot in the back and that'll be the end of my chapter. So it's just like, you know, just do this. My God, what is that? Stop it. Stop. <laughs> so, <laughs> No, be careful, when you touch the bottom, it's crackles and yeah. they can't get you. Oh. Without touching the bottom. Oh, great. Okay. Um, so, uh, I'm going to get in front of that real quick, you know? When I would do drag, I would only do it in the nightclubs where your bodyguards. Because if I want you to do drag on the streets, like you running, they're going to say, kill him, now you're available. Yeah. It's like you're somehow away from the pack. Right. They get you. Yeah, so it's, I mean, but it's just, you know, I mean, growing up here, it was, um, just in the United States, it's terrible. I mean, um, I'm, Dallas is actually a really interesting city. I like it. There are things that I like about the United States and things that I don't like about the United States. I actually just got back from Italy. I was in Italy doing a show. And Italy, you know, they have their problems. You know, there's racism in Italy, but I didn't feel like at any time, you know, I was gonna get shot in the back. Like, so it's, it's, it's weird. But anyway, how that, all that relates to the work. So I decided to make 300, 350 years of history based on the time, the events of time that happened after the death of Oliver Cromwell because all throughout the historical record, the historical narrative, the collective historical narrative, no matter what country you're from or where you're from, the, um, there's always a point, a changing point, a malleable point in history that you can connect to that would change things irreparably. So my butterfly effect was the death of Oliver Cromwell because at the time, you know, um, when Cromwell, after the English Civil War, uh, the Stuart monarchy came in and they were friends with the French and they were gonna bring in Catholicism and they were gonna change things around. And then they were like, nope, that's not gonna happen. So then they brought in George I, the Hanoverian, um, the Hanoverian kings, which is currently the current line of uh, the monarchy, uh, the, what do they call it? House. The House of Windsor or Mountbatten, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, so they were from Hanover in uh, Northern Germany. So I just took it from there, and so I combined France and England, the Franklin is a joke to the French and English people. And, you know, it was in 2003 when I did it, it was, it was 
it was a gas, 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 jumping jack flush, you know? So everybody was, um, you know, very angry about that. But also they, they got the humor in it. And then I just started making these uh, site-specific narratives. So when I came, when um, Allison asked me to do the show, I was like, okay, I'm gonna do Northwest Texas, Southwest Texas, Southeast Texas, and North East Texas. So they're all represented here. This is obviously Southwest Texas, the, the desert uh, scene. Um, this is Southeast Texas, uh, Cattle Lake, um, with the cypresses. And the, yeah, the indigenous uh, people uh, of Cattle Lake actually, you know, I like the crocodiles. Yeah, yeah, and then and, and that, that comes in from, uh, well, yeah, I guess they do live in that swamp, but the, uh, the, the, uh, the guy Galvez, he's, um, that's a, a reference to a film called The Legend of the Never Ending Story, where he was trying to pull the horse Artex out of the swamps of sadness, which when I think of the most tragic thing that ever happened in my childhood, it was probably that scene in that movie. Um, <laughs> and so, your and a powder, yeah, I wore the powder it's wig. Not to make <laughs> so, yeah, I just, I just, you know, I always just keep it on me. And, you know, I come from, again, I come from a theater and film background, so I do a lot of theatricality. A lot of these are, you know, they're just stories, and um, um, I write them down, and I'm actually compiling the book right now uh, so you can actually read what I've written about these pieces. So, while they exist on their own as, you know, standalone images, it's part of a narrative that I've been doing for about. 20 years, so, um, and then I got the Malcolm X games um, back there, you know, just, you know, um, black people just <clears throat> having fun, joy, which you usually don't see it, and, and, and another thing about art um, and, and how I came into it, it was, um, I, I've been showing a museum since the, uh, I had my first uh, museum show with uh, Kerry James Marshall, and Noah Davis in um, 2010 at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. And at that time, um, nobody was really talking about colonialism. Nobody was talking about um, anything, you know. It was just kind of like a, it was kind of like the 80s. It was just a cocaine-filled uh, room called her. <laughs> um, so, you know, and then you get stuff like E.T. sometimes, or criminals, or, uh, Mars attack. Anyway, so, I mean, that's kind of what I felt like the world was at that time. So, I, you know, I, I wanted to just, you know, do this crazy thing. And so, uh, the museums, they, they saw the worth in it. And, you know, they can bring in different people because that's what, you know, museums as cultural institutions, what you want to do is you want to bring the diverse crowd to absorb um, what's happening. And a lot of times, especially in this country, and actually in a lot of countries, you, you just don't see that. So. Kudos to the Dallas Contemporary for that. Um, um, I really don't have much more to say except for. Okay. Yeah, and, 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 I, and I, yeah. Oh, I, I just wanted to say what, what I'm realizing listening to all of you and, and thinking about the show all week is the way your work, while all very different and very much rooted in your own <coughs> lives and experiences and, and everything, there's so much intersection between. The, the, not just the politics, but like just intuitively, like your works, Umar, are like a matriarchy. Like the, the protagonists are so often these women, like look at these cholas who are kicking ass over here. And of course, Carolina's work has this feminist, you know, undergirding, and Taboo's work as well, like deals with the complexity of gender. And all of these questions that now are like basically that Fox News is using to rile up the vote for the other team, but in fact, your work from the very beginning was kind of unpacking all of those complexities. I didn't realize that uh, the uh, drag is a legal thing. It's still on. I thought somebody passed a law that said it's okay to do drag, no? Maybe that was a different state. Every state gets to outlaw yeah, drag here. originally. It was here. But now it's legal, you can do drag again? No. Because yeah. I came to, uh, I actually came to, what? We can do drag. Yeah, that's yeah. I don't think you do anything yeah. anyway, really. Who listens yeah. to like fuckers anyway? Yeah. But uh, yeah, when I first came to Dallas in the 85, I was flown in to do drag at the Strong Club. And now I guess they keep me up to do that. I don't know. Yeah, I, 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 use, I use a lot of women in my work because 
I grew you up with women. Uh, I, I utilize, I employ women. Oh, good, good, good. In the creation. Underpaid, uh, right, of course. Women women should be no, paid. no, 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 pay to, pay to live a wage. Oh, good, good. Five dollars now. Anyway, um, so the, uh, um, you know, growing up in my household, like, you know, I don't have that, you know, it's not that some sad trope. I mean, I grew up in a, in a household with my mother and my father until they separated, and I just, you know, was the last few kids, couldn't leave with my mother, leave with my father. But what I've always noticed, especially is very uh, interesting, I don't know if it's necessarily, uh, um, it only happens in the black community, but they're, you know, just throughout my life, um, a lot of the strongest people in my life have been women. And so I usually like to celebrate that, um, that aspect in my work. Um, but it's, um, but sometimes, you know, I'm just, like, I just tell, like stories. Tell us a little bit, like, I really liked how you, this, this painting to me is what like, a, this, this one, oh, yeah. is, is like an excellent example of how you're mashing up um, both history and contemporary culture and your own story and the fact that these women are um, both referring to the specific history of, and a reimagining of the colonialism that was happening in South, this is South Texas. Or, oh, well, actually, you know, that's but, not an interesting thing. Like, there is no, in my story, there's no United States, there was no George Washington. There, there the United States was never created because France and England were friends, so they wouldn't have fought each other. So that hints when you go back to the malleability of history, you change one thing, you change the entire dynamic. So there is no United States. So this is still technically New Spain. It's not even Mexico because at this time, this is before 1810, so this is before even the Mexican Revolution. So this is Nueva España, and it stretched from all the way down um, to, from, um, uh, well, what is now Panama to Oregon. Uh, so it's a totally different world, a totally different area. But you know, all the stuff is still the same. The indigenous politics still existed as they did. Um, but the cholos and the cholas, I mean, cholos and the cholas, I like doing plays on words a lot of time. And I, when I moved to Los Angeles, uh, I grew up in Chicago. When I moved to Los Angeles, I moved to a predominantly uh, Mexican neighborhood. And so that was like 20 years ago. So where I was used to, um, you know, the culture of Chicago, I had to learn a totally new culture in when I got to California. And, you know, like being there, being present there, and, you know, talking to my neighbors and eating foods and going to and, you know, I totally bitched that. Um, but, you know, going, you know, around um, my neighborhood, I just, you know, start looking at, you know, the culture, and it's like, oh, this is cool, I remember this, and incorporating that into the narrative, because I don't want to just talk to people who like history, I want to talk to people who like rap, I want to talk to people who like archery, I want to talk to people who watched an everything story and did not cry, I want to talk to people who enjoy the Afro ski. I want to talk to people who love to uh, rob stage coaches. Um, you know, so just a wide range of people because at the end of the day, and, and this is something that we almost know, history will repeat itself if it goes unchecked. So it doesn't matter in terms of whoever's in power. It doesn't matter because humanity is really the problem. We, um, we need to, you know, come together and get together um, now because it's, I don't think we can do another uh, revolution of nonsense. Because we had such a wonderful opportunity at the end of the pandemic. I mean, when the pandemic started, you know, the whole world is closed. And then the first thing that people do is they start bombing each other. Mm -hmm. The first thing, like right out the gate. Like you would think I was singing some kumbaya stuff, maybe some lays and, you know, going around shaking hands and, you know, some parties and, and you had the, you know, the Polish repression, you have, you know, the repression of uh, LGBT, yeah, the war in Ukraine, the current war in, in Israel, and, and, and nobody even talks about the stuff that goes on in Sudan, or what's happening in Burkina Faso, or Togo, or all these other places in the world that people just don't care about, the hyperinflation, the rise of ultra-national, 
nationalism in South America. I mean, this is one planet. There are no more borders. We have no more excuses. And so we have to uh, got to move in a, in a straight line. I want to ask you, Carolina, was that Women's March thing in Poland at the same time? They had a huge one here. We never wore like the pink pussy hats. You don't remember that one thing? That was the Trump, like that was Just Trump. 16. That was in that 16. That was before? That was before COVID. But, but it was an interesting, I, I actually participated in some of the pre- There was massive right? all over the world, Marches right? Marches in Poland, but, and it's not that there hasn't been, there has been feminist movement, but it's also the specificity of Polish history that as a communist country, the need for feminism like we had in the West was very different because women were comrades. There was a there was at least lip service paid to that. So I think that the the roots of, of Polish feminism um, are are very different. And so this agency that emerged in 2020 was major. Yeah, but also it's so specific specificity. Specificity for my generation because. Yeah, we, we had a feminism movement before, but for my uh, generation, we didn't experience anything like this before. So it was like uh, um, waking up from, because you know, we thought everything is fine. Uh, this Actually, we had a very strict abortion law before, because they, um, they, but abortion was legal during pre pre communism. Like yeah. in the communist period, you could get you exactly. could but do then, what you wanted with your body. But then they changed it in the nineties. So when I was born, uh, so I didn't know. I, I thought it's like I knew all over the world it's um, uh, it's available, <laughs> but uh, it was like something normal for me because I grew up uh, with with this knowledge. Um, but then this movement came, and I realized we uh, we grew up uh, in some weird place without uh, human rights for uh, for women. And then they wanted to make it even more uh, strict than it was before. So yeah, I think it was something. Um, uh, I think in this country, I think recently, didn't they say the end? In this country, America, didn't they say, United States, didn't they say recently that the anti-abortion is now going to be state by state? It's no longer yes. all that America says you can't have an abortion women. You know, now every Unless state. Trump is elected because he's already. Um, and when? <laughs> anyway. But I, I mean, I think just to, to go back to what Carolina was saying, what's interesting is that. Just like in the United States, in Poland, the, the regime was not just cracking down on women and abortion, it was also gay rights, it was gay marriage, it was any kind of expression. There was so-called gender ideology that was not allowed to be discussed or anything in school. So Poland is actually ahead of us because you had an election this past fall in which at least, while it's not like the most progressive government in the world, it's way better than what's been there. And I think that it's woken up, this Women's March has woken up the agency of younger people who actually went out to the polls and defeated these very unfortunate people who were in charge. Yeah, that's what I want to say, that uh, maybe it's even good they did it because it was like a awakening moment for for my generation. So maybe it will change something at the end. The thing that they said about this next generation, excuse me, in this next generation in the fall, is that it's the youth that are going to vote. And hopefully they're not as apathetic as people of my generation. It's like, ah, it's all fucked up. You don't have a choice anyway. It's all the industrial war machine anyway. It's who the white ball voting. But the kids are like, yeah, a lot of kids, when you get to a certain age, you have that. Like, Woo! Like all that Vietnam War, that was all like college kids, let's get out there! Like even the Black Lives Ma marches in New York City, it was all the kids. Even like the trans marches, all the kids. You know, they're the old, the old queens out there. Give us rights! They're like, fuck, you're not going to give us rights, I'm just going to live my life anyway, fuck you. I, yeah, I, I, I had a, like, I remember when I was in high school in the early years of college, I was 
really gung ho, and then you know I just got really tired. But the basic, I mean, the reason why that happened is because all the books that I read, and this is another thing that people always seem to forget. You know, democracy is an ideal. It, it, it has never existed in practice anywhere. I mean, it never has. It's always, it's, it's a sham. It's, and democracy does not exist. It's, uh, you get some form of, uh, my favorite form of government is, um, what is it, uh, enlightened despotism. I think that's the closest thing you get to democracy. Because as a black man, I know I can't say anything that I really want to say. I've never felt that I've lived in a, dem in a democracy ever in a single day of my life. And so Did some people... Obama? I'm just, I'm being oh, you. never, never, never. I've never, and no one here, and no one alive has ever lived. It's a really fancy Greek word that we like to throw around. But no one's ever seen a democracy because we are terrible creatures human beings. <laughs> so, um, you know, so first, if we start there, then I think we can start to move into more, you know, different ideals of how we want it to go. But if we lie to ourselves from the onset, then we're just going to be making a really bad gumbo, <laughs> you know. And, um, and I just read this, uh, I just finished a book recently. And it's called the Silk Road, and how uh, the Silk Roads actually, and it basically explains the the whole nature of commerce. And at one point in time, everything was focused in the East. So you're talking about you get silk from China, you get um, uh, tea from China, you get um, jade and, and all the spices China. of Indonesia and fashion. And then it, you know, then you have the uh, the Damascus steel, and you have all this stuff that you know came from the first Roman Empire, and then to the second Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire. So you have this whole trade network of the Italians, the Venetian city states, and and um, Milan and and Gen Genovese, and all their sailing to take over the control of the trade from the Ottomans who took over the Byzantines. And so you have this whole thing, but then you have this road, and you know you go to places like Kazakhstan, Almaty. You go through places like Uzbekistan and Tashkent, which are beautiful, Afghanistan, beautiful places and centers of trade. And now, you wouldn't, no one could pay you to go there. But that was the world for thousands of years of human hit, well, at least 1500. Just on another path, I said <laughs> my art's about the joy of being alive. <laughs> it's not about the world's going to end and it's all politics. Mine is about the pretty colors. Look at the orange next to the, the pumpkin yellow and the, the bright blue next to the aqua. Look at their eyes. You know they have pretty eyelashes. Look at the outfit on her. And oh, isn't that, uh, isn't that, uh, you know, the fabric behind her? Isn't that beautiful? And look at the way he draws. Oh, he's so talented. And look at the glitter. Is that glitter? Oh my God, you can do that? Bitch, you can do anything. It's art. And I think the one thing you should do with art is make people smile and happy and want to be alive. Like, why would you want to bring it in the house and hang it up? Not even the buyout, they even bring it in the house and hang it up. They just put it in some storage and then hope that it's going to evolve and they can make money out. <laughs> no, it's just about the beauty of life, the joy, which is what drag is about. So why is it illegal? Because if you're happy, joyous, and free, then they can't control you. You know? Mm -hmm. He's like, I don't need your money. What's that? But on the spectrum, on the spectrum of, from rumors, <laughs> You know, kind of darkness to, to <laughs> taboos, optimism, and, and life affirming. I think that what interests me, especially as an art historian, is the fact that figuration, which is the clunkiest and awfulest word, the least poetry, but the figure is so important because it's a vehicle for humanism. There's humanism in all of your work. Different versions of it, different outcomes, different prognoses. But that, that's why I've always been interested, just even as a child, in work that has people in it. There's just this something that's like, there's this the human narcissism of seeing your, like yourself or a human being like in the time machine of a painting. But it's also like the fact that Carolina's paintings you know, speak to a universal experience that is both gendered and universal. It's taboos, freedom, and, and complexity, and joy, and it's your revision and, and 
pretty dark. Um, <laughs> and I do love the art with people in it. That's my favorite thing. Like, I've never really done anything totally abstract. I always have some little representation of life, of humanity, I like faces, I like people. So all my art always has some kind of people, whether it's through a puppet or a, or a cartoon, you know, you know what I mean? I like life and people. That's the fun of it all. In fact, just as a side note, in a historical uh, reference or footnote, you know, when you, if this is very meta, that's like a new term that keeps you, you take a picture of something, you take a picture, you take a picture. Like, who's afraid of cartoony? What do we call this show? Figuration. <laughs> You said, oh, it's a take on Who's Afraid of Virginia Wolf, which is a take on Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf, which is a song which won the very first Academy Award when they said, let's start awarding Oscars for the best song. And it was Disney, of course, Disney was the big, biggest capitalistic uh, monstrosity, maybe even bigger than Starbucks. Uh, but Disney's <laughs> huge. It's, it's maybe even rivals, it probably is the same thing as the industrial war complex, but it is. <laughs> Anyway, they're huge, and they they really brought cartoonism into it. Everyone's like, "Whoa, we want to do cartoonism!" In fact, my favorite movie is Wizard of Oz, which they wanted to. But Snow White came out; it was so popular, and everyone they go to see Snow White. What the fuck, you know? And uh, so they tried to do like a Technicolor version of it because everyone wanted that. And Disney's first big hit was a short called. Three little pigs, you know that story? Like, who's afraid of the big bad wolf? The big bad wolf? The big bad wolf? Who's afraid of the big bad wolf? And just laughing at all the evil that wants to come by. And how can you outsmart the evil? Like, the first one's like, oh, I just want to play him. So I think she makes a house of straw. The wolf comes by and knocks it over. The next one's like, oh, I'm a little boy. I'm at least put on by it. We are a brother that reigns. And she knocked over the wooden house. The other queen's like, come get me, I'm at stone brick house. You could huff and puff and blow yourself out, give yourself a conniption, say, die, motherfucker. And then you know, I'm not there, and they dance to me, like, this is I love it when you mock them. That's how you really get it. It's humor, beauty, and glamour. That's how you fuck with the evil people. They can't deal with that. The next time on the Dama You Show, the wild one. The wild what did she say? Yes, she was Lebanese, and they said, you're not going to be famous, you're too Middle Eastern. Get a nose job, change the thing, and we're going to make you famous. That's what she did. But they took their money, and now they give all their money to the kids who die of cancer. St. Jude's Hospital, Danny Thomas. Where all that money comes from. But if you, the kids are going to die from cancer anyway. Imagine that job. Ay, ay, ay. Living with that. But they probably used to come for art to make it happy. Do they ever live to 20? This is okay. cancer. Well, can you stop, can you cure cancer, and can you stop the international war machine? Is there ever going to not be war? Is there ever going to not be cancer? Probably not. So let's have a time of the life while we can, right? Try something colorful, have fun, at least be nice to the people around you, right? And it doesn't matter if you're old or black or rich or white or gay or lesbian or transgender or homeless or whatever. You know, treat everyone equally, you know? Uh, but you gotta be careful, because there is, like he said, like, humanity, there is evil that lurks deep inside each one of us. And you might think, oh, not much. No, not me, but mm, eventually maybe something comes up. You don't want to be careful. Anymore. But try to be positive. <laughs> try to be nice. Try to be happy. And that's why, like, you know, they say, oh, it's queer. For instance, I don't like that word queer. Queer means, to me, like, you're different, you're wrong. Like, to me, no, in fact, they're gonna force me to, like, Sex with a vagina and have children and have married. To me, that's queer. To me, that would be so queer for me. For me, to be me, it's just it's natural. But, uh, you know, so I don't, I don't understand it. So to me, I like the word gay. Because it means, woo, gay, let's be gay, girl. You know, and so why they went out all drag? It's just about being gay. Happy and gay. Why do you want to do that? I think Crazy, right? Yes. Oh, yeah, the question? Yes, the question I think this is a, yes, I think we could open it up to questions. Yes. And, um, <laughs> and um, should we, uh, would you want to stand up with the question? No, or? this man right here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Please. Wait, thank you. Go down here. Here we go. Thank you. I, I can do it up, Mike. That's all right. You're all right here. Oh. Uh, 
So uh, a little bit about the figuration, the uh, questions about that. And you sound like maybe you've written about the yeah, idea of figuration and all. And I've always thought it meant sort of more of a um, uh, very directness because you can look at the image and read it pretty right. easily. And that's a good, bad thing because maybe you don't connect with it too. So you could argue that if people don't like the point, you know, it doesn't withstand the um, public scrutiny either. Well, it's not, you know, I mean, it's, Art is an open thing, right? So you can walk away from it. You don't have to like it. But I think what I was, in the original essay that I was writing, I was um, taking up the fact that throughout, like the taste, the people who wrote the first draft of the 20th century, especially from an American perspective, were so dismissive of art that came out of a representational or figurative um, perspective. And there was this kind of, um, you know, like the dominance of the men who wrote the art history, of the gestural painting, of the abstraction, of the advanced art that all of this was caused. And I was just very, as a, as a kind of intuitively very person who's attracted to antagonistic positions, I was wanting to kind of forced myself to understand a genealogy in art history that um, used the language of the cartoon and didn't give a shit about these prohibitions of so-called advanced art and culture because I was educated in a very, um, like I don't know if anyone remembers October Magazine, but I studied with those people. And um, they were very dogmatic about what was real art, what was serious art, what could be political, what could be topical. And to me, I thought, you know, Taboo and Carolina and Umar and Sally Saul are as topical as a Mark Rothko or a de Kooning or whatever it was that was forced down our throats as graduate students. So that was kind of like the, my coming to Jesus about trying to understand what was my own interest in, in art throughout time. So I hope that answers your question or if anyone wants to Time it. Yes? Yeah, I just wanted to say, just standing back here, all this color, everything is so colorful and cartoony and like you talk, you know, uh, uh, pictures and big and cartoony and colors. And then you look at taboos, it's all black and white. But it's like the most happy and gay and, you know, odd, like you were saying, like you were talking and like you express yourself, taboo, looking like, oh, it's black and white, and it's, the mo it's one of, I mean, to me, it's one of the most visually, like, sort of jarring, uh, because it's, it's so, uh, uh, I don't know, but, but it goes so well with all of it. It's so beautiful. That, like, there is combined all those faces, those monster faces, and then that French fry lady, that just is so odd to me, and her joints don't work, and she hurt herself, and it just all looks so groovy. Thank you. Thank you. There's a question here in front. Um, I know that Sally Saul can't be here, but I just was so committing on how do you feel like her work kind of enables uh, and turns out the pieces? Sally is. Sally Saul has a, a mind that reaches into many different dimensions. So I think she's like a multi-dimensional being. Like, uh, did you, you, you didn't get a chance to speak with her when she was here? She is just, I mean, the way her mind goes, um, much like all of us, like we're all very, we take, you know, things from history or from our minds and, you know, life in general and create these fantastic stories, but she just does it with with ceramics, and if you could have talked, I mean, she's not like very bolsterous or whatever, but a boisterous. She's just, she's just um, she's quiet, but you know, she thinks deeply, and I, I love it. I wanted to buy that cat, but I couldn't. It's just still in the yeah. tank. <laughs> I want to say. I want to say. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I also feel a strong connection with her uh, works uh, because yeah. They are obviously hard to do as my paintings, but also she uh, she puts so much her private stories to her art. For, for example, 
this uh, this man in a grey uh, suit, actually this is a pyjama, pyjama. So this is her uh, husband, who is uh, Peter Soule, who is uh, also a great painter, and yeah, so this is also like a major gesture to, you know, she, like maybe I could better <coughs> explain this situation, but um, yeah, I, I think they are very involved in uh, like everyday life, but also, like, you know, everything is political, like, private political. Well, so. I mean, I think it's interesting because um, both Peter and Sally were here, and I mean, Peter Saul was one of the artists that in an idealized form of the show, I would have had like works of Peter Saul and like- And they were the historical. original culturally representational yes. people from in the heart of the 50s and 60s, yes. abstract expressions. Yes, outside like the of far the founder of this, this movement, if you want to call but it. But it's so interesting that he, like this was the first time that they were traveling across the country for Sally and not Peter. And Taboo posted um, a cover of Art Forum where you guys were both, Peter and Taboo, were on the cover of Art Forum in 1980 something, right? And I just was like thinking about how it's such a, it, it, going back 500 years, this is a story where the you know, women, whether they were the daughter or the wife, and they had access to training because of that association. And Sally is having, you know, the beginning of a moment, but like Sally has, you know, this was a very, it was very important to me that she be front and center in the show. Any more questions? Well, it's pretty true that she, uh, you know, now I guess there's a moment in time where women art can be appreciated. Yes. So it's great. She lived long enough to do it. The same way, I feel the same way. You can be queer in the art world, out, gay, even in drag and be appreciated. I'm so glad I live on. I'm 65, so I got it there back in New York. I'm the old elder statesman here. And it's wild just to live to see it. Most of it don't live to be appreciated until decades and centuries after they're dead. Van Gogh, I don't think they even, you couldn't, you could sell, you could buy a Rembrandt for five bucks until like the 40s or something. You know what I mean? The 1940s, not the 1640s. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a question. Just another, uh, Carolina, this is for you. Um, I, I, I'm a little embarrassed to ask this because it's going to be like, well, duh, the hands are so prominent, the eyes, the mouth, whether the hands are doing something or the mouth's covered. Or the, so I'm just curious, that makes me wonder what else is in this series or if hands, eyes, mouth has something further messaging. Uh, yeah, sure. This is a question about like all my um, art practice because uh, these appears in many of my paintings. Uh, and sure, uh, it's important for me to place uh, part of the body uh, in the paintings. But yeah, I don't know how to how to answer this question. Yeah, because in, actually, in uh, each of the paintings. So uh, I put this pan a pancake on her face to just uh, shut her up. Uh, also, yeah, behind this painting there is a story about my grandma who used to uh, fry pancakes every Friday. And it was like a huge mountain of pancakes. So I, I just realized why I actually painted, uh, maybe because of this story from childhood. And actually my grandma couldn't go to the university because my grandpa forbid her to go. So it's like somehow connected maybe. Uh, yeah, and hands like a tool of, um, like that can cause pleasure, but also can, can cause harm, uh, you know, both. What else? Isn't that uh, with the hands in the pickle jar? You said that the pickles is where you preserve shit. Like you want to preserve when you be shut up, kept yes. in the kitchen. You put your hand in the pickle jar and stir shit up. And you're like, that's like, no, exactly. it's not. Well, get back in the kitchen. But, but both. Uh, 
you, you can get stuck uh, in this jar in your household, in uh, your country, but also it's a little bit about preserving your, yourself, so, so keeping yourself more. Did you have a traumatic experience in the kitchen? Like cooking, do you not like it? No, uh, it's good you ask. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> what did you say? I'm sorry. That's what I said in the beginning. So, uh, yeah, my uh, heroine is not exactly me, but uh, she speaks Spanish. Yeah. So, uh, I think that's the reason why I don't like to cook. Because 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 I don't like to cook. Uh, no, no, I think that's it. Yes. Uh, but yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. Maybe we'll take uh, one last question. from this side? Question. Um, Come on, you must say something. I had one. Oh, you had no question, right? Okay. Um, so, uh, just a few weeks ago, the head of... Oh, you don't like the microphone. No, I don't like the microphone. Everybody's already handled it, so good luck. Hope it's here. Um, <laughs> A few weeks ago, they had the zine fair here at the Dallas Contemporary, and it seemed pretty successful. And I was just curious, uh, uh, you know, if any of you uh, have thought about, you know, your work in comic books or zines or anything of that sort, or, or just in general, if you thought about it as a kid. Well, the catalog for the show is a zine, which is available in the lobby for thirty dollars. <laughs> and actually, I have many zines. I mean, just it just ended two weeks ago. The Brooklyn Museum, all right, Brooklyn. New York City, they had a huge zine show. I was, in, I was in the zine show then. So yes, I'm already in the museums for my zine work. So yeah, <laughs> and for in the 90s, I worked in magazines. Remember that? These are things called magazines. And I was a very successful one of the top illustrators in all the magazines. Sports Illustrated, Vogue, uh, uh, all that. What? Paper. Paper, New Yorker. Uh, Shout out to Kim. The which one? Kim Paper. Kim? Oh, Kim. Kim, Kim has Kim. Kim. from paper. Oh, yeah, she loved me. She never paid me a dime. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Um, I, I actually have, a, I have several books. Um, the one is called uh, The Wars of the Frivolous uh, Revolution and Other Conflicts. And it came out in 2010. Um, there's one that's called uh, Kill Your Best Ideas. Um, there's one called The War of the Morning Arrows, and uh, now there's one that's coming up next week out of Italy uh, called uh, La Legenda de Dolomiti, uh, which is a, a story about, um, it's actually like, kind of like a love story um, that takes place in adult minds. And they're visual, drawn. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's basically, so all these things, like I, um, everything that I make is part of a, a large area, and eventually uh, it'll go into a, a large um, tone at some point uh, when I get all the writings together. Um, and then there's also the um, uh, I, I'm going to make a film as well. So, oh, what are they going? What the hell's going on? Yeah. Yeah. The cabin maker left me. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I hate to eat raw, but I have a plane to catch. So, Allison, you want to wrap it up with some conclusions? <laughs> I'm just going to wrap it up by saying thank you so much. Taboo, you are a national treasure. <laughs> Carolina, thank you for coming all the way from Poland. Omar, we're running for um, office in 2028. The empathy party. Yeah, Omar.